Good afternoon and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studio Online Lunchtime Talk. These are live every Friday at 1pm, beaming out onto your smartphones, laptops, iPads and living room TVs. My name's Luke and I'm the Good afternoon Pervasive and Media welcome Studio. to the Pervasive Media Studio Online Lunchtime Talk. These are live yeah. every Friday at 1pm. So we've been doing these for a year and I did that on the first talk of 2020 and I've done it on the first talk of 2021. Anyway, as I was saying, my name is Luke and I'm the studio producer. These talks are our chance to throw open the digital doors of the studio and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community or who are working on things that excite us. And especially big welcome to those of you who are new to the studio for whom this might be the first time you're engaging with what we do. For all of those out there, here's a little bit more information. The studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology with everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art. We're a partnership between Watershed, University of the West of England and the University of Bristol. And we're a home for early stage ideas, companies and projects and a meeting place of both the creative and commercial industries. We offer studio space, desk space, meeting rooms, event space and opportunities and it's all for free for our residents. Ultimately, we are a safe place for artists, companies and creatives to take risks in their practice and make time for collaboration. This week's talk is the latest in a series of talks as part of our future theme season. Recently, the studio funded several residents and their collaborators to convene deep conversations about art, technology and society. Conversations that are both hopeful and critically engaged. Since October and through to this month, January and beyond, there will be talks focusing on what has emerged from those uh, conversations. And some of those are up on our channel already, which you can check out in the playlist that this talk is part of. Today's talk brings together studio resident Alison Neighbour and collaborators Ken Eckland and Vikram Ayenga, and they are live from the UK, USA and India simultaneously. They're gonna be talking about gaps in data maps, rising sea levels and the responsibility of leaving the best gift in the world. There'll be a Q&A at the end with the talk rough, running roughly at 25 minutes. If you want to ask any questions, do just pop them into the chat window and I'll pick them out as we go to ask the speakers. Or if you like, you can tweet us at PM Studio UK with your questions or feedback or thoughts. Please feel free to share this link now on any of your socials. A captioned and recorded version of the talk will be available here after the talk is finished. Before we start, next week's talk is called Vaccines in Pop Culture. For this talk, we're delighted to be joined by Faraha Asani, who is Watershed's new research lead. Faraha will be discussing vaccines, the roots of vaccine myths and vaccine reluctance, and the, the place that vaccines occupy in popular culture. You can get news on that and all future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or by subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Don't forget, while you're listening to me talk, hit the subscribe button beneath this video and give the video a thumbs up. The more likes we get, the more subscribers we get, the more we can share stories like this. I'm now going to hand over to today's speakers, Alison, Ken and Vikram. Hello, um, my name is Alison. I am a designer for performance and I create socially engaged scenography that seeks to place the audience at the heart of the experience, mostly with the landscape as a stage and integral part of the story. I'm from Wales. Um, I grew up in Chepstow, Newport on the Severn Estuary, and I now live in Folkestone, where the sea is very much part of my daily life, um, and where the changes that the tide makes to the landscape are really clear in the cliffs and the stones that are shifted daily here, uh, sometimes by man, sometimes by the sea itself. Um, I'm here with Ken and Vikram, uh, who have been collaborating with me on developing a project I conceived called the Future Wales Coast Path. So I'm going to hand over now to Ken to introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. I am an artist who uses game design mostly to create collaborative thought experiments to help us imagine positive futures, um, to help people play what if, and also to help people uh, deal with the unknown. Um, I'm here in the Western USA. I've lived in Arizona and in California thinking about my connections to the land. But right now I live on a forest hillside in Oregon. Um, if you go back 50 years, this land was a timber farm. If you go back 100, it was a homestead. Uh, if you go back 1,000 years, it was hunting land for an indigenous tribe, the Kalapuya. If you go back 15,000 years, this land was on the shore of a great glacial lake. Um, it was beautiful then, and it's beautiful now. Uh, over to you, Vikram. Thanks, Ken. Um, 
Hi, I'm um, Vikram Iyengar. I'm a dancer, choreographer, director. I also curate and present movement-based work in Calcutta, where I live. And I also research and write on various arts-related topics. Um, my work is basically spans practice, discourse, critique, ideation, and a bit of management as well. And I'm really interested in creating uh, deep connections with and through the arts. Um, I was born and now live in Calcutta, uh, which is where I'm also signing in from. And Calcutta is the last city on the Hooghly River, which is the Indian branch of the Ganges before it enters the sea in the Bay of Bengal. Um, and we'll be talking about that region, the Sundarbans, um, in a bit. Uh, I met Alison in July 2019 um, at an arts and climate change residency in Snowdonia. And um, she invited me to be part of this project with Ken. So handing it back to you, Alison. The starting point for this talk is a lighthouse that will sit on the future coast part of Wales. A few miles inland on the Gwent levels on the edge of the village of Mega which is a small community edged by salt marsh and on the outskirts of the city of Newport. The lighthouse is connected via the magic of global data systems to a town in Bangladesh called Chittagong, which sits on the eastern edge of the Bay of Bengal. It's a port city opposite the mouth of the Meghna River, and it's on a latitude with the Sundarban region. When the tide rises in Chittagong, the lighthouse in Wales flashes a warning to alert us to the risks the Bay of Bengal faces imminently from sea level rise, and to remind us that the storm will come to us in Wales and the rest of the UK as well at some point. It's predicted that by 2050, 150 million people will be displaced by sea level rise. That's in less than 30 years time, so it's not that far away. Um, some of those people currently live on the coastline of Wales, many more of them live in the Sundarbans, where the sea is encroaching roughly 200 yards a year. Uh, others live in the Pacific Islands, Florida, Western Canada, Norfolk, Essex, the list goes on. Um, so I'm going to hand back to Vikram now just to tell us a little bit more about the Sundarbans landscape, because that's what we're really focusing on with this piece of work. Thanks, Alison. Um, so, uh... The Sundarbans, um, while we're talking about that, many of you may not actually know where it is and what it is. Um, so it's, um, here's a map. Um, it's the largest mangrove area in the world and it's shared by India and Bangladesh. It's fringed in the Northern curve of the Bay of Bengal, which is you know, a huge body of water, it shouldn't be called a bay really. And it's home to the largest Delta system in the world. Uh, it's made up with, um, with the river systems of three rivers, the Ganga, the Brahmaputra and the Meghna. It's three river systems, not three rivers. So it's really quite a massive um, enterprise. Um, now the map shows you uh, some of the networks uh, and channels, but the more you zoom in, the more complex this gets. Um, so now this tidal landscape may look very idyllic and peaceful, but actually it's unpredictable and dangerous. Uh, in the network um, of hundreds of rivers, the tides rise up to 30 feet twice a day, and they drown and reveal the islands um, both times. Now, mangroves um, are specialized to live in these uh, conditions with their pneumatophores or breathing roots, but really the ecology of the entire region is extremely, extremely fragile. This is the home of the Royal Bengal Tiger. You can see um, pug marks in, in the silt. All these are photographs that um, I've taken on trips to Sundarbans over the years. Um, it's also home to the king cobra and the gangetic crocodile. So it's not the most hospitable region really. Um, but it is also home to um, millions of people who live in one of the most densely populated and poverty stricken uh, and ecologically fragile areas on earth. People literally live on the edge in huts, in the kinds of huts that you see. Um, their, uh, their means of transport are country boats that you see in the photograph. And those two women um, uh, in the river are basically spawn fishing, which is a meager um, uh, means of livelihood. But remember, those waters are infested with crocodiles and the forests have tigers in them. Um, so the Sundarbans are only about 100 kilometers south of Calcutta. Um, they used to be much closer, but we've cut them back a lot and we continue to cut them back at our own peril. Um, and why do I say that the mangroves, as many of you will know, are nature's defense against the tides. 
Um, the tides travel about 200 kilometers inland, way past Calcutta. Uh, but with the claw-like roots uh, of the mangroves, they hold the soil in place and stop erosion. But of course, we seem to know better. So in island after island, these wonderful trees have just been replaced with defenses of concrete and brick and sandbags. And then island after island, of course, these man-made defenses have been breached uh, by the waters, the saline waters of the river and the sea. Um, so these photographs are from the island of Shagor, um, and you can see the many layers of breachings. And these photographs are from the island of uh, Ghoramara. Uh, when we took these photographs 10 years ago, the island had already lost one third of its land. I don't know the situation now. It is an in in inhabited island. Um, the only success stories are where communities and NGOs and government agencies have come together to actually do replantation drives. And this is again from the other side of Shagor Island where you can see um, that you know, replanting of the mangroves has really helped. Um, but you know, even as these survive, uh, other islands disappear forever in, in the rising waters. So this is a photograph of the Matla River and this is really the width of the river. It's, it's quite massive. Um, so the Sundarbans is a microcosm of, of the climate crisis and all its complexity, um, you know, whatever problems, rising sea levels, soil salinity, uh, cyclones, um, unplanned, unsustainable development, terrible infrastructure, man-animal conflict, dense human population, poverty, deprivation, you name it, it's all there. And yet it's one of the most uh, awe-inspiring landscapes uh, that this planet has to offer. Back to you, Alison. Thanks, Vikram, for that context on the Sundarbans. Um, it's so obvious, you know, what an impact climate, cri climate crisis can have on, on that place. And I think what was interesting to me when I started work on this project was really that, you know, the people who live in that place, their mothers and fathers, they have homes, they have livelihoods, you know, in many ways, they're exactly the same as we are in the UK, as everyone is in, in America and, and everywhere else in the world, you know, we're, we're all we've all got the same things that we care about really deep down. Um, so then what I was interested in was that really the land, literally it's shrinking, you know, all around the world. But bizarrely, we're not shouting about this from the rooftops. We're, we're not changing our building methods. We're not really planning for where and how people might live. Instead, we're actually putting up barriers um, to talking about that and putting up literal barriers around the sea instead of trying to deal with the problem. And we're not really having enough conversations in the right amount of depth about this issue. Um, and it just surprised me. And so this map that's coming up now, it, it kind of demonstrates, you know, in Wales, we're actually still building family, family homes on floodplains as if there had never been water there and never will be, even though there are flood maps readily available that show us this is a really bad idea. So this is a copy of the Natural Resources Wales Flood Risk Development Map, um, which you can find online, it's publicly accessible. And I've highlighted a new housing estate in Sudbrook, which is just across the river from Bristol. Uh, it aims to attract families and young professionals from the city of Bristol to come and live in the countryside. Um, you'll see it's quite close to the floodplain um, and the show home there actually had to close last year because of rising groundwater. This is an estate that's literally just been built um, so it just kind of shows the extent of that issue of, you know, we're, we're really ignoring this still. Um, so the idea of this lighthouse came from a desire to sound the alarm, to start this conversation and to connect people to think about how we can adapt to the future. I wanted to physicalize this idea of impermanent land in the landscape itself. So it can be felt in a way that a map or a newspaper article can't really offer. So it's intended, this lighthouse is meant to be a point of convergence, a place for encounter, and potentially a site of pilgrimage from the past shoreline to the future shoreline. So I was working on this for a while, uh, and then I realized I'd gone quite far with the idea, having designed an experience for one person, when the whole point was about starting a conversation, and you can't have a conversation on your own. Also, this is a really difficult subject to be alone with. So that's quite a problem. Um, I wanted to find agency for the audience, for them to feel empowered and connected 
um, to connect more deeply with the twins location to, and to not um, to not just take the data from another place and, and run away with it and use that for something without acknowledging that other place that the data came from. So if conditions allowed, I'd be inviting you to walk with me from the current shoreline of the Severn Estuary to the future edge of the land, which is significantly inland, to feel the distance of that journey, to meet the lighthouse, and to reflect on how we might adapt to this impermanent shrinking landscape and the loss of everything held within it. Since that isn't possible, we'll go on another journey, following the pathways that myself, Vikram and Ken have explored to try and find ways to connect over time and space, each of us in different countries, and each bringing our own personal experiences and bodies of work to this encounter. A key thing that we discovered during our conversations is that the data set I was working with has a huge gap. So whilst Europe and the UK have hundreds of tidal buoys connected to the IOC Global Sea Level Observing System, Africa has hardly any. India and Bangladesh have one each. It's not, hard, it's not to say that no one's researching sea level rise in those places, they most definitely are. But for some reason, they're not connected to this particular global monitoring system. The position of the twin locations of the lighthouses has been dictated by the data source, but that doesn't actually reflect the places that it would be most valuable to connect with. So including the St. Albans that we just heard about, those places that are most at risk from sea level rise. So again, we see that inequality coming through as we talk about climate crisis. So those are some of the challenges that we've been exploring together. We've been testing some experiences for connecting audiences and our own working practices across the miles and time zones that separate us. And we're gonna share some of that with you now. So I'm gonna hand over to Ken to begin. Hi everyone. So what are you looking at here? You're looking at our ideas all gathered together in threads on an ideation board. Uh, in my talk today, I'll follow a path I made through this collection of ideas, hitting the points that were kind of aha moments for me. And you're all welcome to view this board yourselves on Miro. You can examine it in detail. Uh, we'll post the link. So next slide, please. Okay, now you're looking at a chess grandmaster playing about 50 people at a time, um, which segues quite naturally into how do we connect across time and place to imagine the future, a future with sea level rise? Well, when people think about sea level rise at all, they think that it's in the future. They think about its impact on people who are getting flooded out directly. In short, we kind of think about it as people versus the sea like the people who are going to be affected are all desperately playing their game of chess with the grandmaster. Um, next slide. And now you're looking at the sea as a card, kind of like a tarot card. So the suffering that people are going to suffer is one aspect of this. But in time, my, my, uh, my thinking began to focus on the sea itself and kind of our relationship to it. I mean, the sea is this great symbol of the unknown. It's the mother of all life, they say. And it leads to this idea that we're getting into problems, getting into these sorts of problems because we don't really understand the sea. Next slide. So now what we're looking at, you're looking at a murder wall or some people call it a crazy wall. Um, but in this case, the conspirators are like coal companies and capitalism, and the victim is the climate, and of course us. Oh, and the murder wall uh, in this picture is falling apart. So I began thinking about the sea as kind of an embodied counterpoint to our sense of time. I mean, I feel this at a primitive level, like when I go walking along the seashore. Um, I have my frantic rhythm. The sea has this kind of cosmic ebb and flow. I'm kind of moment, moment, moment. The sea is kind of infinite patience. So really beginning to see the sea as a hyper object, um, an object that actually extends through time and experience, not just something that's here for the moment and gone tomorrow. So next slide, please. 
Uh, early on, Allison brought up the durational performances of Sarah Cameron Sund, who stands in one spot as the tide comes in and then recedes. Really quite amazing. Um, to me, her work stands in really sharp contrast to this idea of trying to play chess with the sea. I think it's about learning to understand the sea, learning how to coexist with the sea, and learning how to endure. It's really inspiring work. Next, please. Which brings us to the future coast, the future Wales coast path as a gameful and embodied experience. I don't think the work is about resistance, but I don't think this work is about resistance. I think it's about resilience to learn how to ebb and flow like the sea. I think that if we understood this better, there wouldn't be houses built in floodplains in Wales. Um, and so I like this card that Allison created, um, the one that we're looking at now. I mean, it's gesturing towards having to establishing a ritual for this sort of embodied experience. Next, please. So when we reached this point, I was understanding the work better as a kind of, as a gameful experience. It really has something to say. It has a connection to make. We can all collaborate on better understanding the sea and these forces of nature, which basically we cannot control. In particular, we can help each other look beyond the moment, look beyond life into lifetimes. Uh, we can help each other see past our human horizons into the rhythms of the planet and really become part of them. Next slide, please. As, as a game designer, I care a lot about the audience. I care a lot about the player experience um, down to the very nuts and bolts of it. Um, games embed their ideas in what their players do, actually do. So we thought a lot about the meaning of experiences a player would have on the path and at the lighthouse. On the Miro board, there are kind of all of these threads about exercises and uh, possible experiences for people to have. And we were exploring really how these experiences could connect players to us and connect players to other players. Um, is there audio that we share as we walk the path? Do people contribute to that audio? Are there views that we share as we circle the lighthouse? Uh, we touched on those specifics uh, in our explorations, but we didn't dive in too deep just yet. And so, as part of our exploration, I imagined that I had a lighthouse situated on land right near me. So this is land which is 60 miles from the ocean. It's land which is alongside a stream that leads to a river, that leads to a mighty river, that leads to the sea. There's kind of this direct connection uh, to the ocean. And so I really came away from this exploration thinking this might be a way to democratize this work um, for people to realize that no one is really that far from the sea, that no matter where you are, you could have a lighthouse because the sea calls to you and in time you return to the sea from whence you came, that you are as impermanent as the land. So that was my rather Zen-like path through our explorations and Thank you all. So now uh, over to you, Vikram. Thanks, Ken. Um, so uh, yeah, my, um, hang on, I'm just trying to get the right slides in place. Yeah. So for me, there have been two primary concerns that, that sort of directed my engagement with the project and my contributions to the project. Um, one, um, how do I consistently carry some sense of the Sundarbans question and experience uh, such as I have uh, into the process so that we can actually open up the conversations to areas um, whose stories and situations are really dire, but who probably don't find reflection in the general awareness of, of the climate crisis. And the second point um, is that my artistic practice um, grounds itself in, in uh, movement and space. But what could I bring to an idea that did, does not essentially require this. 
as a performing artist, I focus on um, on the live uh, moment, on 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 the ephemeral, uh, a current experience that is shared by artist and audience in the same time and place. Um, so, how could I imagine a landscape-based experience uh, without the presence of uh, of the artist? And perhaps it's the impermanence of of the performance experience, um, which is what makes which is one of the things that makes performance special that connects to the impermanence of land that is at the heart of this project. So um, these um, are sort of uh, my connect connecting points in hindsight. All this is on the Miro board. Um, the body of the landscape um, and landscape of the body, uh, apparent movement uh, across apparent stillness, um, the impermanence of land, the impermanence of the live experience, performance experience, rhythms of the tides, rhythms of the dance, experiencing space and time and time in space, and patterns, recognizing them, responding to them, creating them. So these central concerns informed my response and participation, or maybe my response and participation sort of coalesced what my central concerns are and were and are. Um, it's a two-way street after all. And I'd like to share with you some phrases that remain with me uh, as sediment. Um, how can the global experience happen across time and space without knowing who you're sharing with or even when? So sort of global anonymity. What do seas sound like in twinned locations? Can they create a sort of melody of connections? Resilience and vulnerability as two sides of the same coin. Ken has already mentioned resilience. Um, Maybe they're two sides of the same lighthouse as well. The lighthouse as a gravestone, what could the epitaphs be? For who, for what, by who? How do we leave dedications? What pledge can we invite visitors to make at the lighthouse? So looking at the lighthouse as a place of pilgrimage. And the ethics of twinning. Um, for example, does your twin individual in your twinned location have the luxury of, of this contemplation that you're engaging in right now? Or are they too busy just trying to live through the day, each day? So one of our processes um, was to each devise tasks uh, that we could imagine uh, offering to visitors uh, to the lighthouse and they could choose to do them. Um, and we of course responded to uh, the tasks that we proposed amongst ourselves. And you'll find both all the tasks and the responses on the Miro board. But I'm, I'm just going to leave you with two um, task provocations that you may like to explore in your own time and definitely in your own, in a place of your choosing. So here's task one, which is um, walk. Listen to the rhythm of the seconds on your watch, on your phone. Stay still for at least a minute. Walk taking a step every second on the pulse, step every second beat, then every third beat, then every fourth beat. Feel the spaces in time and the time in space. Task two, stand. The ground beneath your feet, is it grass? Is it sand? Is it stone? Is it mud? Feel it with your bare feet, bare hands, bare cheek, whisper a secret message to it. Stand on it with one leg. Does the ground shift beneath your feet? Thank you. Back to you, Alison. Thanks, Vikram. So as Vikram and Ken have just been mentioning, we, so we created this mirror board um, and we had an idea of creating a conversation through mini artworks that functioned as invitations to respond. So each of us started a thread and sent a provocation to another who then sent a response and sent it on again. Um, and we looked at how this might be a model for an audience experience of sharing gifts um, and passing on responsibility for the future to the next person. So through this testing, I really became very interested in this responsibility of the gift and how this connects to our responsibility to future generations and the role that chance plays in who will experience what. There was a real joy in, in receiving a gift from another artist, 
And therefore a great responsibility was felt in passing on something that would be valuable, that would be of quality, and that retained the essence of that story that had been passed to me. It was also about the immediate moment as much as about the future, because I only knew the one piece of story I'd been given and the one that I would pass on. The next step in this journey touched on our interconnectedness and how climate crisis is intertwined with the refugee crisis. You know, who are we to think we have it bad here? And it does feel quite bad here at the moment, but it's worse elsewhere. A home lost is a home lost, whoever you are, wherever you are. And around this time, um, when we were having our conversations online, there were fires raging in the Western USA, really not that far from where Ken lives. And, you know, we were talking about this on our calls. And at the same time, we were having really spectacular sunsets where I live in Folkestone, you know, really exceptional. And then I found out that those sunsets were apparently caused by the dust from these fires on the other side of the world. So it really kind of hits home that the planet we all live on is, it's really small. The connections between us exist in the atmosphere really, you know, beyond that quantifiable data. Maybe the water that washes the shores of Folkestone contains drops that have also visited the Sundarbans at some point. And this exchange somehow led to these fragments of places. Um, so leading on from this image that Ken provided, I started to think about these places being bound by this unraveling string, these precious fragments being suspended in the air just for a few moments. And then they become washed away in the great roar of a tidal wave, followed by the quiet calm of a half submerged abandoned relic of a past civilization. Um, and the caption there says, you've come to the shore. There are no instructions. And I felt that kind of summed up where we are right now, that there are no instructions. We have to make those up. And so we arrive back at our lighthouse uh, where our intention is to end on a message of hope that we might together create those instructions for the future. We don't have the answers. In fact, I think we've probably all got more questions than we began with. And we'd like to invite you to help us answer them. So that mirror board that we created, it's going to remain online. Um, we're going to share the link in the chat if that hasn't happened already. And, you know, we'd really welcome your comments, your thoughts. Um, we'd love to hear your questions. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Alison, Ken, Vikram. Uh, some really nice feedback already rolling in uh, on the chat um, for the talk and the first few questions have landed. Uh, just to highlight one of the pieces of feedback that's just come in is uh, someone says, they, uh, Joe Lanza says, I really appreciate the pace and depth of your talk, your thinking and your ideas in this frantic week, um, which uh, through whether you're in the UK, India or uh, USA, has been, there's been different things happening in each of our countries along those lines. So uh, that's um, nice to kick off with that, a slower pace in a hectic week. Um, Duncan Speakman asks, Ken, you've worked on multiple collaborative online projects concerning climate uh, collapse over many years. Have you noticed shift in, shifts in audience thinking and have they influenced your approaches? Um, certainly, uh, the audience seems to be way different, you know, kind of every time I launch a, pro launch a project. Um, and that has to do um, partly with kind of the platforms that the projects get launched on. Um, you know, they're kind of reaching, the platforms I think are reaching further and further into kind of the population at large, uh, which is a, a really good thing. Um, it would be hard for me to kind of characterize uh, what those changes are, except that I think diversity of opinion seems to be getting greater and greater. Um, or maybe that's actually just kind of a reflection on me where I'm becoming more and more open to diversity of opinion and hearing it better now for the first time, it's a little hard really to parse that out. Um, but, but I think the overall impression that I get having worked on several projects like this is really a hopeful one that more and more people are speaking up, they're able to speak up, and that diversity really enriches kind of the, the, the result that we get from these sorts of thoughts experiments. There's kind of more and more of the possibility space 
for the future is being opened up. Thank you. Um, Alison, a question from Twitter. Uh, why a lighthouse? Out of all the associations that Lighthouse may have for us, what, what called out for you specifically? I think, you know, lighthouses are so present on our coastline, in, certainly in the UK. And for me, they, they're a warning, but they're also a place of safety. You know, it's saying this is land, this is safe, but also this is dangerous. It's a risk if you come too close, if you're on the sea, coming too close to a lighthouse. So there's really something there of that, that signal, that beacon that really dates back through time from them being the fire beacons to them being now the modern LED lighthouses of that light, just being that signal, that warning of something bad could happen here. Hey, you all mentioned it in some way in the talk. So uh, Vikram, what, what, what do lighthouses, how, how, what, could you expand a bit more on how light, lighthouses resonate for you? Um, well, it's, 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 it's one of the things we discussed quite early on, sort of relates to one of the things we discussed and we also brought up in the talk that um, uh, the image of the lighthouse for, I mean, India has a huge coastline, um, but really I, I don't know how many lighthouses we have uh, and how many uh, positions of, um, of safety or um, uh, data collection or any, any of those things. So for, I know that there's a lighthouse on the southernmost point of India uh, as a marker of, of, of territory, but I, I really, I've seen more lighthouses in Wales during my time in Wales, um, which is smaller than the state I live in, um, than, uh, you know, having traveled across India. So uh, I'm really not sure what um, the relationship of a culture and context that I'm from, what that relationship would be to a lighthouse. Of course, it would mean something to people who are in the sea in terms of the Navy and blah, blah, blah. Um, but for example, if you look at um, uh, fishing boats and fishermen, they still rely on word of mouth. They still rely on the Coast Guard going out and telling them there's a storm coming, come in, uh, which is why we also lose um, fishermen uh, to cyclones every year. So it's, I don't know, it's, um, it's one of the things we discovered that it's not, it's not as Alison was saying, it's not an equal, equally balanced world. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And sticking, sticking with, uh, with, with, with India and yourself for a second, uh, if I may, Vikram, there's another question in the chat, um, which is, uh, they, probably, they say, sorry if I missed it, but uh, what, what is the specific data that's coming from India that's being used to inform your conversations? Yeah, so that was one of the things that we discovered very early on, uh, that uh, the, title, uh, the title boys um, data that Alison was looking at, which is available online, um, the data uh, from India and from Bangladesh uh, that is available, there's one uh, collection point in Vishakhapatnam, which is nowhere near the Sundarbans, it's quite much further down south. And there's one data point in Bangladesh, I can't remember where, uh, while Europe is full of them. So uh, it struck us immediately that actually um, the regions of the world that are uh, on the forefront of the climate crisis, as far as sea level rise is concerned, really don't form part of this map that is available online and this data that's available online from this particular site. I'm sure if we'd looked further and found other, other researchers, et cetera, to talk to, we would have found um, other connections and uh, there are, but I think, um, this readily available data is not um, is not there, and that was one of the big gaps that we identified, and that sort of set set us thinking of okay, when we are talking of twinning, who are we talking of twinning? Because we don't, how are we going to do the twinning when the contexts just don't seem to match? We have to rethink what we are looking for and um, how we create those connections. Yeah, so that's we haven't solved that question, and that's a perennial question. I don't think that. <laughs> It's going to be an easy one to answer. Well, if anyone out there is watching who might be able to help with filling in some of the gaps of the data there, please do uh, drop your uh, contact details into the chat and we will pass them on to today's speakers. A um, couple more questions in the chat that I was picking up. Um, Alexis asks, uh, Alison, I'll put this one to you as, as, as the set designer um, or uh, uh, set design being part of your practice. Um, how would you feel about the image of the lighthouse and the simple blue wavy lines and rising storm being replicated in street art? I mean, I think the more it's there, 
the better. And I think I still have a lot of questions around the creation of a what feels like quite a permanent installation. You know, we've built one of these. Um, it's in a crate in Cardiff because of reasons around COVID. Um, so it hasn't been placed in the landscape yet, but there's something about it that feels very heavy, very permanent. So I'm not sure if it is the right structure to tell the story of impermanence. So if it was street art, there's a natural impermanence to graffiti, which is actually quite nice. And particularly in a city context, you know, that feels like quite a natural thing to do. Mm. Um, so I think that's that would be a really interesting way forward, you know, in the graphic imagery of it kind of being used in different ways. Um, and the shapes of the wavy lines, they actually represent the shape of the light. So the, um, the smaller lines are what the light does in response to a rising tide and the spikier closer together lines, that's actually the SOS um, pattern. And that's what happens when there's a storm tide. So a particularly high astronomical tide. Um, I can also answer in a bit more detail about where the data comes from. It is the Global Sea Level Observing System. Um, which is a United Nations scheme. Um, and that data is freely available on the IOC sea level monitoring service. And you can access the data from all of the different tidal bodies that are connected to that. Great. That's a really interesting resource for people to be able to play with. Um, Zoe uh, Rasbash um, asks, how have you found you all bring different understandings and assumptions on nature, environment, climate change when developing your work? Ken, maybe I'll ask you to kick that one off. Sure. Um, well, I, I think that it's become clear in our conversations that there is a relationship based upon where we individually are. You know, I've, Allison referring to, I mean, she takes her walks on the beach. And so that's really kind of a refresher um, for us about that. And, and me, I'm quite a ways from the ocean. Um, but I'm still connected to it in, in kind of these other ways and really kind of exploring those. So, and, and also I think we're all at different levels or we have different viewpoints um, about um, just like the question asked about our relationships to nature. Um, you know, we've had different experiences in our lives about, you know, kind of what nature represents. Um, Allison just um, told us about, you know, while we were having our talks, there were um, forest fires out of control, you know, not that far from me. Um, I'm huddled in my house because of the smoke outside is so bad, um, you know, for those. And so for me, it was really kind of trying to see nature not as this force, the sort of danger um, to my livelihood, but rather as this force which it's a little bit presumptuous. It's a lot presumptuous perhaps for me to think that I control or that I know about really and have a little more respect essentially for the, for the forces of nature, how they take care of um, the planet um, and how they take care of me uh, and how that caring can break down you know, when it's really been um, misused. I guess Vikram as an extension then for, for, for that question is um, would be how is it how how has it felt from from your perspective as a collaborator in a place where you're you're, you're seeing the real physical change and rapid physical change yeah that, like like climate change is bringing to the world yeah I have to say that um, unfortunately uh, for urban India in general or even the whole of India in general thinking about environmental sustainability in any shape or form is not the norm. Um, so one of the biggest, you know, eyesores that we noticed on not just trips to the Sundarbans, but anywhere in India is the amount of litter and the amount of plastic litter. Um, so uh, on the one hand, uh, if you go into areas like the Sundarbans, which are rural, um, you have a, so, uh, the people there ha have the ability to read uh, nature and to read the tides, to read um, uh, you know winds in, in a way that we we just don't have because they live that they live that on a daily basis. But on the other hand, um, there is still um, 
the the use of very very unsustainable material some of it out of habit and convenience and some of some of it because it's um it's just too expensive to be any, to do anything else uh, so you can't use uh, for example for for transport you can't use uh, clean uh, fuel because it's just far too expensive to send clean fuel all the way to sundarban so it's it's um it's it, it's really a, a crisis not just of the environment but really about social uh, levels in india and 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 the poverty within which a lot of the country lives yeah yeah so radically uh, different context with lots of linkage going on as well right um it's really interesting um look i'm sticking with you and and to shift away from the, the focus on the environment side more to look at your kind of performance background you, you you've noted as a performing artist that you're used to immediate kind of synchronous response so how have you adapted your instincts for that into this project um well for me it's really about um about the audience experience whoever whoever comes to the lighthouse and what can i actually offer which is why i shared those two tasks because they are from um literally from choreographic tools it's not uh, necessarily what you would perform on stage but choreographic tools about walking in time choreographic tools about experiencing how to stand and rooting yourself in a certain space and spot so just the kinds of instructions i would give in a choreographic workshop um uh, or in a warm up um how do i tweak those to actually give a simplified version perhaps of those instructions to visitors to 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 a lighthouse uh, who are going to be in a landscape so to add things like does the ground shift beneath your feet because i don't know what they're standing on i don't know where this lighthouse is um but really and the fact that you're going to be barefoot how you know to have that direct connection with the element of of earth or stone or whatever it is so to use the tactile nature of the body um and the relationship of the body and space um to enter this conversation with the environment and uh, i mean that's something we should be doing anyway because it, you know there's nothing between our skin and the environment really so um but how can i use my choreographic practice just to um zoom in to that natural re- relationship um a little more to get people to think about it a little more Thank you. Um and Ken if I might come to you in terms of kind of some of your practice that's informed the the research right? um can you tell us how you, a little bit more about kind of how you might see this work as a game? Sure. Um I uh I am a game designer but but really I kind of focus on play. And so when I was looking at this project I was looking at the lighthouse and the whole experience of the lighthouse the path leading up to it the path leading away um kind of as an invitation to play really interested in seeing a, a lot of the games that I develop uh have to do with building a narrative people contribute their voice to the sort of very multi-threaded um construction of a a big narrative about a subject like climate change. And so my question really was how is a lighthouse uh an invitation to play for people? And then what move do they make, you know, even though they don't necessarily think of it as a move? And then what do they see as a result of having made that particular contributed that particular piece? How does the narrative grow? Um and we we already have lighthouses or you know presumably we have a lighthouse that's connected what else moves along that connection more than data what's the sort of personal angle um vikram was just talking about how a lot of the world still operates um like fishermen making decisions not based upon data but based upon personal um stories that pass from person to person about what the weather is going to be like and whether it's going to be dangerous and if so where um those are the sorts of messages that um to figure out a way that that can be communicated you know perhaps as audio when people are walking along the path um perhaps as audio when they actually reach the li- reach the lighthouse uh trying to figure out what the means are by which that can be communicated in a way that's really accessible to the widest number of people that isn't dependent upon language 
upon technology, you know, making those as light and as approachable as possible. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, Dana Roy uh, mentions in uh, the chat, uh, St. Durban's also has a very dense and rich ecology, which has been rapidly changing due to the climate change. It might be interesting to perhaps archive and connect changes to the fauna and bird life around lighthouses as well, another extension potentially of the, of the research around lighthouses. Um, and like, you know, bird life and uh, changes to that in both all our countries, because that is a significant impact of climate change. Um, there's another question, uh, Alison, we, we, we may be our last one. Um, let's see if we can squeeze one more in. Um, Rick Park says, can we use the image of the historic flooding of the South Wales Gwent levels, uh, in a, as it was just an ancient etching picture apparently, to communicate the reality of what we face at a community level? Yeah, so that's an image of the, um, what's called the Bristol Tidal Wave, I think, the Bristol Tsunami, um, some of you might be familiar with, um, which was in 1607, if I remember rightly. Um, so there's an etching of that happening and of people standing on their roofs and cows up in trees and, and all of that. And, you know, it's interesting, that image, because it looks kind of similar to images that you see on the news of flooding in the UK and other places. Um, so I think there's something of that human experience that translates to now, like that experience of losing your home to a flood is exactly the same as it was in 1607 to how it is now. So yeah, I think that it's, you know, it, it could be a photograph taken a few days ago in a place that had just flooded just as much as it could be an etching from 1607, really. And right. I think it's important to remember, you know, that that land has flooded in the past. So, you know, it, it could have water again. Um, thank you, Alison. Uh, and thank you, Ken and Vikram. Ken, uh, particularly, because those of you who have finished your lunch, Ken hasn't even had his breakfast yet. It's that early <laughs> in America right now. Um, but thank you all three of you for joining us um, uh, and for telling us more about uh, the future themes research you've been embarking on. Um, there will be a blog um, that comes as a, uh, comes off the back of uh, the work that the, the three have been doing, um, so keep an eye out on uh, the PMTD website for that. Um, before you all go, next week's talk is called Vaccines in Popular Culture. Um, it's by Faraha Asani, who's Watershed's new research lead. Faraha will be discussing vaccines, the roots of vaccine myths and vaccine uh, vaccination reluctance and the places that uh, vaccines occupy in popular culture. You can get news on all on that talk and all our future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram or by subscribing uh, to this YouTube channel and giving the content a thumbs up. The more you do that, the more we can share stories like this. Um, a captioned and recorded version of this talk will be available as soon as we're finished here. Um, thank you so much to everyone who's joined us today for our first talk of the new year. The programme for the year ahead is all on the website, as I said. So please do check, us out, check that out and join it again. Share this link. Um, if you've enjoyed what you've seen, uh, send us a tweet and tell us what you thought. Um, for now, uh, enjoy this first weekend of lockdown as much as you can. And we will see you all again, same time, same place, next week. out of the conversations so thanks for sharing um yeah yeah uh, thank you